Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. Today, we share inspirational stories of survivors impacting the lives in our communities. You can watch here or on Facebook at Asian American Life. Now, here's a look at what's ahead on our show. The Great Jazz Age. Paul Lin traces the Asian roots of jazz music. Tina Beth Pina reports how an acid attack survivor is gracing New York's fashion runway. Plus, the forgotten people, a look at the Cambodian refugee resettlement in America. And small enough to jail, Kyung Yoon reports on the case of Chinatown's Abacus Bank. This and more on Asian American Life. We start our show here in the village where many jazz musicians got their start. But did you know many Asian American musicians have been influential in jazz since its very beginning? Here's more. I'm Paul Lin. Plenty of jazz institutions here in New York, but even fans may not be aware of the long history that jazz has in Asia and how jazz-inspired musicians there make their way here to become recording stars. Like Brooklyn-based Kiyoshi Kitagawa, the jazz bassist and composer moved to New York from Osaka, Japan almost 30 years ago. He got his first big break playing late night jam sessions with the Harper Brothers at the Blue Note Jazz Club. They really liked my playing. Then I came back, came back to Blue Note you know, almost every day, every night, around you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning. Then I played with them. Those jam sessions at the Blue Note led to an invitation to play a gig at the legendary Village Vanguard. A recording of that gig became Kiyoshi's first on a major label, Verve Records. It's a live record, and it's a big, big thing to me. Kiyoshi grew up in Osaka, one of the jazz capitals of Japan jazz gained popularity across Asia from the 1910s and 1920s. The latest dance music could travel from the U.S. overseas in just a matter of weeks by steamships making stops at major port cities. And so sheet music, uh, recordings, and musicians, it could take roughly three weeks um, to get, say, from San Francisco all the way to Manila. They would go by way of Honolulu and then go to Yokohama and Kobe and Shanghai, Hong Kong. In those cities between the world wars lived jazz-hungry Europeans and Americans. They lived in colonies from the Dutch East Indies to British India to French Indochina and elsewhere. Jazz became Asia's pop music intertwined with politics and colonial conquest. And that really developed in the late 19 teens after World War I into the Jazz Age, which we think of now. And that's primarily associated with dancing at the time. And so jazz was just the music to accompany social dancing. In Shanghai, by the 1930s, there's famously this genre of music called yellow music. The composer Li Zhenhui is someone who did a similar thing, combining elements of Chinese folk music with jazz. While few recordings of the period survived the communist revolution, such music has inspired a revival and reinterpretation from the Shanghai Restoration Project, among others. It's a testament to the lasting impression jazz has had in many Asian countries since the early 20th century. And so there does start to be this emergence of, of you could say, kind of hybrid genres or, or versions of jazz that do take on all sorts of different local styles. So in Manila, I was interested in exploring a genre called the Filipino Foxtrot. With the demand for jazz in Asia came a growing need for musicians who could play it and be hired on a budget. So from the late 1910s, Filipino musicians started to be hired to work the dance halls and hotels playing jazz, both in Manila and far from home. 
Filipino musicians are much cheaper to hire than white musicians, than African American musicians, than Hawaiian musicians. And so they really start to spread throughout the entire region. So there are Filipino musicians basically in every major city that you can think of, uh, from Rangoon to Penang, all the way up to Yokohama, over to Bombay. Including a young Filipino trombonist named Nicanor Nick Amper, who performed in India in this recording, as well as Singapore, Shanghai, and eventually New York. Fritz tracked down surviving family members on Facebook as part of his research. That was very exciting to kind of go from looking at microfilm, which can seem very kind of dull and dry, and, and realizing that, you know, hey, these are, these are people's relatives. These are people who, you know, had exciting lives. For roughly a thousand Filipino musicians, by Fritz's estimate, touring in jazz bands offered an income but also a chance to leave the U.S.-occupied Philippines. So think about popular music, in this case jazz, as both this agent of colonial conquest, but also giving rise to new musical expressions, new opportunities for work and travel. And jazz continues to offer those opportunities today across Asia, inspiring musicians like Kiyoshi Kitagawa to pick up jazz in Osaka, eventually quitting university studies to become a professional bass player to the dismay of his parents. I told him, I told to my mother too, you know, how I love music, how I love jazz, how I love playing bass. Then, you know, then there is, you know, okay, okay, your life, go ahead, you know. Jazz in Osaka was one thing, but listening to bootleg cassette recordings of jazz performed in clubs in New York was a revelation. I listened to that, whoa, it's great music in New York, happened in New York, now I need to go. And he's been here for almost 30 years, playing gigs with other musicians and playing everywhere from Newport to Tokyo and Europe. As a composer, he's paid tribute to his Eastern roots on an album called Ancestry, which incorporates Asian melodies with jazz, bringing our story full circle. The kind of melody, the kind of scale, it's very, very familiar with to the Asian people not only Japanese, also Chinese, Korean. Jazz music's deep roots in Asia, creating a legacy today, both overseas and in the U.S. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. Between 1975 and 1994, more than one million Southeast Asians came to the U.S. as part of this country's largest refugee resettlement program. Many from Cambodia came to the Bronx in the 1980s, as many residents there were leaving. Now the story of the Bronx Cambodians is being told in a new book. I was, I'm a girl who was born in Cambodia, um, grew up in the refugee camps, and raised in the Bronx. Um, and that identity to me, the core of that is being Cambodian. Chaya Chom was a young girl when she arrived in the Bronx with her family. Her mother had fled Cambodia when the brutal Khmer Rouge regime took over the country, killing and torturing millions. The lucky ones found themselves in camps in Thailand and the Philippines. Chom says her mother, who moved from camp to camp, longed to move to the U.S. wanting a better life for her children. And you know, in the refugee camps, we, they, before you came, we came, they showed you videos of what it was like to live in the United States and you know, how to open the television, the refrigerator. So it was an opportunity for me, not necessarily for herself, but for her two children, my sister and I, um, to thrive, because she survived um, the war and violence. In 1985, as part of the largest refugee resettlement program in the U.S., Chom's family found themselves in the Bronx. So this building right here, where the Batambang market sits, was one of the first buildings that uh, Cambodian refugees were resettled into. Professor Eric Tang is a former community organizer in the Bronx and a recent fellow at CUNY's Asian American Asian Research Institute. He's author of the new book, 
unsettled Cambodian refugees in the New York City hyper ghetto. After the 1960s, many of the middle class families moved out of the ghetto, um, were, were pushed out and left behind were the poorest of the poor. And so sociologists refer to this new era of the ghetto, which is not just racially segregated, but economically homogeneously poor as hyper ghettos. According to historians, 55% of the Cambodian refugees resettled in areas that had been abandoned and distressed. Not just the Bronx in the 80s, but Providence, Rhode Island, Philadelphia, and Lowell, Massachusetts. The 10,000 Cambodians who settled in the Bronx also faced poverty, violence, and discrimination. And I recall when I was growing up in the Bronx that my uncle used to always experience violence, always getting beat up and always fighting all the time because he was getting, and he was in high school, so he was a lot older than me. Um, and people, our people getting robbed and living in poor conditions with no hot water when we were resettled into the most um, horrible buildings. The condition hasn't changed. The Cambodians shattered the stereotypes of the so-called model minority. So the Cambodian population here in the Bronx economically reflect what's happening with Cambodian refugees across the country. And that is they've maintained some of the highest poverty rates, some of the highest unemployment rates, and some of the highest high school dropout rates in the country. 80% of the population receives some kind of welfare assistance, and many in the community continue to suffer from PTSD, the horrors of war still lingering in their everyday. We have in the U.S., with respect to our refugee policy, this doctrine of work first, or work immediately. It doesn't matter if you just came from a war zone and haven't healed from the mental and physical traumas of war. We want you to get a low-wage job immediately. And there hasn't been much improvement in 30 years. According to the latest census data, 42% of Bronx Cambodians live in poverty. Close to 24% are unemployed and 62% had less than a high school education. I don't think our U.S. refugee policy is really a resettlement policy. It's a policy that says, okay, here's who we're going to take from certain countries based on our geopolitical interests. But once they're here, there isn't a plan economically for how they're going to be fully integrated and um, develop the social and economic capital they need to secure livable wage jobs for the long haul. Today, the Bronx is a different place. It's still New York City's poorest borough, but crime and unemployment are down and businesses are moving in. While many Cambodians left seeking better opportunities, this part of the Bronx still has the largest Cambodian population in New York and is known as Little Cambodia. Unlike many Asian ethnic communities in New York City, there aren't the kind of normal ethnic signifiers that um, you see here in the Bronx for the Cambodian population. Uh, restaurants, you know, mom and pop shops, um, even social clubs, you don't see the signage like you do in Chinatown or Koreatown. And that's because the refugees who came here were largely penniless. Uh, they were not capitalized ethnic entrepreneurs that could then establish what sociologists call an ethnic economy. Because the Cambodian population is shrinking, those still here have to fight harder to make sure their community is being served. One woman who continues that fight is Chom. There's so much opportunity, but there's also, there's so much pain too. You know, I think the Bronx haven't really recovered from the 80s, um, the war on drugs. I want to be part of that recovery. We came when it was, when people were leaving and we're not going to leave. We're going to be part of rebuilding this community. She wants to leave her mark. She has been an active community organizer since she was a teen, and now she is founder of Mekong NYC. The mission is to really organize the Southeast Asian community to stand up for themselves um, through arts and culture, to organizing. This former refugee is raising her family in the Bronx. She doesn't live too far from where she first landed, and she isn't planning on leaving anytime soon. I think the Bronx is amazing. Um, I think um, I would not want to be raised anywhere else <laughs> except for the Bronx because I'm a badass because of that. <laughs> Imagine your life completely changing in one single instant. How would you handle it? Could you handle it? And is it possible that you become an even better person from it? 
This is a story of resilience and inspiration like you've never seen before. If I want to forget what happened to me, I cannot. I'm waking up in the morning and looking myself without a makeup on a mirror, and that mirror is showing me what happened to me. 12 years ago, at just 19 years old, Monica Singh's life and appearance were drastically changed when she became the victim of an acid attack in India. In an instant, 65% of her body was burned when attackers hired by a man she refused to marry threw acid on her. What do you remember about that fateful day? I was just, I went to watch a movie with my friends and I had a plan to go for a shopping with my mom. And, uh, but during those times, during those travel, then the attack happened. Is it hard to talk about? Not anymore, because I've been talking about for past three years. Reminiscing all those things, what I suffered, how I was screaming, how I went to hospital, how much uh, I was in pain. And the pain is not like some, it's a pain that nobody could, I wish nobody could ever experience. It was a life, like, you know, living, burning pain sort of thing. So that's really horrifying for any human being or any girl at that age. Nearly 50 reconstructive surgeries later, Monica Singh isn't only living her life, she's defining it. Armed with two fashion degrees she earned after the attack, the budding fashionista has not only graced New York City catwalks during Fashion Week, she's also a freelance fashion designer who's making the fashion industry rethink what beauty is. You know, when people say to you, you cannot do that, and you are not fit for that, it gives me, what the hell, who are you to tell me? And it's exactly that happened. I was studying fashion before my attack too, but I continued because I won't, I'm not gonna uh, leave anything unfinished. I know that people say that fashion is majorly all about the beauty and the perfection and everything, but that's what we ask them to show us what kind of a person you are, what your heart says. So beauty is all about that. So I hope I can get more opportunity to change the whole myth about the beauty is. Monica's first step in revolutionizing the beauty myth was founding the Mahendra Singh Foundation in 2015 in honor of her late father. He devoted his entire life to helping others as well as his daughter after the acid attack. The foundation raises violence awareness and reaches out to survivors of gender-based crimes in the U.S. and abroad. This uh, organization helps for victims who suffered a rape, physical abuse, domestic abuse, and yes, uh, acid attacks too. And the girls who lose their whole confidence. So we want to turn their life back around. We want to make them not just a survivors. You want to make th survivors into a thrivers now. But if we can t give them an education or any skill they want to learn, they, can, they have something to live on. I understand more than anyone what girls need. So I'm trying to make it work. I'm, I hope that in future my foundation becomes that big. If something happens, we can provide support and help to these women or anyone else as well. Monica's foundation provides more than just support. It's giving these women a new outlook on life. Oh my God, I couldn't believe that so many girls are living their dreams now. Now they are don't they don't care about their scar. Some girls share girls and women are sharing their pictures that how they used to feel that they are not normal and how they're not gonna accept in the society. Now they don't care mm -hmm. because I showed them it doesn't matter. People gonna look at you once, people gonna look at you twice, but the fifth time you are in old news, that's what I always been saying, and that's what my dad told me. Monica's resilience is so infectious that the UN made her their global youth ambassador. I hope that my life is an example for young women around the world. An example that despite all odds against young women, it is possible to dream it is possible to fight. Looking back and then looking at the success and the future success that you're going to continue to have, would you take what happened to you that day back? Would you take it all back if you could? 
Not in particular at this moment now. I think I moved on and uh, I think uh, I don't want to go to past uh, at all because now I see life really differently. And I think if the purpose of my attack was telling everyone that you can be strong even after that, that is good enough purpose for me to keep living my life. That is the biggest purpose. and. If I can change one person or two person's life and make them happy and more positive in their life, I think my purpose is done. For Asian American Life, I'm Tina Beth Pina. I'm Kyung Yoon at the Abacus Federal Savings Bank in New York City. Many economists consider the 2008 financial crisis to have been the worst economic catastrophe since the Great Depression. It led to a $700 billion government bailout of the biggest banks whose reckless lending had caused the crisis but were considered too big to fail. And while many of these financial giants like Bank of America, JP Morgan, and Citibank were required to pay fines and penalties, not one of them faced criminal charges. But this small family-owned bank in New York's Chinatown got a very different treatment, and many see it as a miscarriage of justice. The story of Abacus Federal Savings Bank, the only bank indicted in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, is the subject of a PBS frontline documentary by the renowned filmmaker Steve James. It exposes a double standard in the way justice is carried out when a bank is not too big to fail, but as the title of the film indicates, small enough to jail. We spoke with the family members of Abacus about their David and Goliath battle for justice. Today, we are announcing the indictment of the Federal Savings Bank on mortgage fraud, securities fraud, and conspiracy a federally chartered bank that has been catering to the Chinese immigrant community since 1984. What they wanted was plead guilty to a major felony, a crime. But Thomas Sung, the founder of Abacus Federal Savings Bank, refused to plead guilty. For one thing, Abacus didn't deal in the kind of risky subprime mortgages that had triggered the financial crisis. In fact, the bank had one of the lowest default rates in the country. The Sung family chose to stand up against what they saw as a district attorney unfairly picking on the little guys. Thomas Sung's daughter, Jill, explains. The DA's office is in, one of, in the largest city in New York City where there's a lot of banks and a lot of financial activity. And I think that the DA himself wanted to come across as someone who was a strong financial cop. But I don't think they really had the strength and wherewithal to go after the larger banks. Even though we were small, he was able to write off, just even be able to say, write off the fact that he went after a bank. What was especially interesting was the way the DA pursued the public relations aspect of this prosecution. Reporters in this town were treated to this extraordinary photo opportunity, this almost Stalinist looking chain gang. I'm a former prosecutor, I'm not soft on crime. I've never seen a spectacle like this. These people were humiliated intentionally for no good reason. They thought that they could, since we're small, we're insignificant, which also is mind boggling to me because we actually service a very vital and important community. Vera Sung and her sister Jill work with their father to run Abacus Bank. They say the problem started in late 2009 when they discovered that one of their loan officers, named Ken Yu, was soliciting bribes and fraudulently altering income statements of borrowers for loan applications. Vera told me on that, I think it was Friday afternoon, and we stopped the closing. We said we can't go on. And then literally Monday morning, I spoke to him and he was out, you know, we fired him that day. The Sung sisters promptly launched an internal investigation, which led them to root out and fire two additional rogue employees. And they reported the case to regulators and law enforcement so that they could do a full-scale investigation of their loan department and help eliminate any other unscrupulous staff.
but it soon became apparent to the Sung family that the DA's office was more interested in coming after the bank instead. Law enforcement, at first you think they're there, they're there to help you to figure out what's going on. But then it's shocking to find out that actually you are the target. There was never any dispute that Abacus had approved false loan applications. The question was whether the blame rested on the actions of a handful of dishonest employees, as the Sung family claimed, or did the buck stop with the bank and its senior management, as the DA's office insisted, for imposing corrupt practices and policies? This was at the heart of the criminal proceedings that took more than five years, 900,000 subpoena documents, and a trial that lasted five months. It takes a lot of like strength inside of you, but also well, I'm lucky I have my family. We're also all lawyers. So we are trained in this system, and we, we know when something is not right. And you have to be able to work within the system to be able to stand up and fight. The prosecution's case rested on their star witness, who was none other than Ken Yu, the crooked loan officer that Abacus had fired, who had received a plea deal for testifying. His lack of credibility on the stand and the absence of any evidence that Abacus's senior management had ever condoned the activities cited in the indictment led a Manhattan jury to find Abacus Bank not guilty in 2015. The court later dismissed all charges against those employees who were forced to walk in the chain gang. We reached out to the district attorney's office, but they declined to comment on the case. We all wept because of the jury's decision, finally vindicated all of us, I concluded this uh, terrible ordeal. We were exhausted financially, $10 million in legal fee, plus the loss of the business opportunity in, in surviving carry the bank for five, five and a half years, or five years or more. It's great that we did this and we prevailed, but I was talking to someone the other day is that there's not that many victories right now for our community, the AAPI community. And there's a lot of issues and a lot of challenges that our community is facing. Um, so I think it, despite all this, we, we still need to, each one of us individually have different fights that we have to fight to stand up for our principles, to stand up for community, and we have to embrace those fights and try to push them as forward as much as we can. Two of the 11 former employees who were forced to walk in chains are now suing the DA's office for malicious prosecution. But the Sung family says they won't be pursuing further legal action. What they have learned from this experience is the importance of standing up against injustice, and they're hoping their story will inspire others to do the same. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. Be sure to follow us on Facebook for more at Asian American Life. I'm Erna Bell DeMillo. We'll see you next time.